Okay, good, good. All right, then, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We're coming to the end of Timothy today, and um, we ask, uh, this is a tough chapter, Lord. It, it does teach us that, again, about the mystery of iniquity, that there are just some who don't want to hear what you're saying or teaching and have set themselves against you, what you're offering, and, and um, we have to be sober about this, but we also have to keep preaching and teaching. So um, help us then to hear this exhortation by St. Paul today and, um, and live as those who joyfully hear your word and try our very best to heed it uh, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I'm going to just mute you all because there is some background noise. Um, I want to um, give a quick introduction here. Um, the, um, we've been looking at the letter of Timothy, and as I mentioned to you last week, um, we have a, um, a letter here that's much more, um, the thoughts are more random, they're less organized. It's kind of like, you know, almost think, it's almost like St. Paul was jo jotting down some post-it notes and sticking them on a scroll and sending them away. Uh, so the thoughts are more random. Um, they're, 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 it's a less organized letter. And that's just the nature of it. Um, and so we'll see here that Paul uh, brings this letter to a culmination by giving an exhortation to Timothy. He warns him that many will be stubbornly refusing to hear the gospel. But he also says that indeed um, uh, that his mission remains the same, to preach it anyway. Okay. And then he sort of wraps up the letter by saying, you know, mentioning some people by name, asking for certain things to take place, things you might expect at the end of a letter. Uh, he mentions, I left some scrolls behind. Please have somebody bring them to me at the nearest convenience and things like that. So we'll, we'll see that uh, the, the very last part of this letter is just a, um, uh, he mentioned some names and uh, other things. But let's begin here then with uh, somebody, I'm in uh, 2 Timothy in the fourth chapter. And would somebody like to read tonight? Okay, Liz, you can unmute first. <clears throat> okay. Um, Go ahead and read the first uh, five verses. And four? Yeah. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season, Conv convince, rebuke, and exhort, be unfailing in, pr in patience and in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itchy ears, mm. they will accumulate, uh, mm, minute, accumulate for themselves teachings to suit their own likings. Mm -hmm. and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. Yeah. As for you, yeah. always be steady, endure sufferings, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Yeah. Now listen, there's um, something, this, um, this very opening word is a very interesting word in the Greek. It says here in my translation, I charge you. What, is, what does yours say, Liz? I charge you. Okay, same, same word. Mm -hmm. um, others sometimes say I earnestly declare, whatever. Um, the Greek word here is dia marturomai, huh? which, which I don't know if you can hear the word martyr in there. Marturomai. Some of you know enough Greek to know this. What does the word martyr really mean? It, it refers to someone who dies for the faith, but what's the key insight of the word martyr, martyr? Death. Well, no, that's what I was just saying. That's that's m many of them did die, but why did they die? Because they they bore witness. The word martyr or martyr martyros means to bear witness. See, bear so witness. what he's calling he's calling Timothy to he's charging him, but in the in the sense of look, you're not just a teacher, you're a witness. The martyromai, you are a witness. Um, and yes, if necessary, to the point of dying for this word or being persecuted. So we hear that part of the martyrdom, but the, it is, at its heart, the Greek word martyr mean, means a witness. 
and some did witness by dying. But all, all of us are called to be martyrs in the sense that we're all called to witness. So this isn't just, hey, Timothy, uh, you know, uh, be present, uh, talk, uh, teach, do a lot of Bible studies and teach. And um, don't, he's, not, he's not just saying teach. He's saying, I'm saying to you right now, uh, be like one who stands before God's people as a witness and uh, that um, who, who is willing to suffer like witnesses do for this word, see? So again, dia martyromai is the Greek word, and it means, again, to be like a martyr, to stand before them, charging them. Uh, I'm suffering for the word, and I'm charging you as a martyr, as a witness, and I want you to do that for them, okay? Now, would that we could recover this idea? And I think when I say recover, there's just too many people today, and, and especially some of us who are older, Remember a time when it wasn't really that risque to be a, a Christian in America, you know? Now, sometimes some of you are even older enough, to, uh, even older than, uh, who, than I, you know, who remember a time when it was pretty tough to be a Catholic, you know? <laughs> and there was a lot of persecution against Catholics. And then some of you are African-American Catholics. Yes, indeed. And you know, that's like a triple threat, you know? <laughs> you know, you, you're not just African-American, you're, you're, you're a Christian and a Catholic? Oh, yes. Whoa, that's, you know? That's so, the yeah. So, but, but really beginning in the 1950s and certainly by the 60s, being a Catholic and being a Christian and so on, wasn't really that something that you're going to get all that beat up about, you know? And, um, and in many countries, of course, you know, there are still many people who really do suffer for the faith. And we may be, and we're starting to head back there, right? See, so many of our Catholic teachings run against the, the demands of the culture today regarding sexuality and marriage and uh, uh, runs against, you know, the teachings on religious liberty and just, you name it, there's just a physician-assisted suicide, abortion, you know. So we're getting increasingly back into the hot water. But the normal and natural state of a Christian is to be one who suffers for the word that uh, we cannot think that we're really going to effectively preach the gospel unless we're willing to suffer. Be a martyromai, hmm, that word martyr sitting right there in the middle of it. We're called to this witnessing. We give, we give people charge. We, we charge them to keep this way. And um, so um, I would say that uh, there's a lot for us to remember, and we're going to have to regain more of a sense of this, especially starting with people like me, like priests, uh, and those who are, you know, bishops and others to realize that it's, it's going to be increasingly dangerous and increasingly troublesome to our peace to speak a very clear word uh, to God's people, uh, especially if the world overhears, you know. Um, and so we'll leave it at that. But, um, you know, and you, you who are parents and grandparents, you really already know this, don't you? I mean, how much guff do your kids give you when you would sort of charge them to, to do what's right and not what's wrong? Oh, mom, oh, dad, there you go, dad. How come? And it's not so bad, and everybody else is doing it. And, you know, those are, that's kind of a martyrdom by a thousand cuts, right? <laughs> uh, but it's that, you know, that constant, no, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. So we've got, you know, that type of stuff too, just the daily little things. And then there's going to be, as I say, we go along increasingly. But we believe, and simply reading a text from the Bible is increasingly being defined as a hate speech, okay? Uh, or a microaggression, or I need a safe zone from your Bible, that kind of stuff. And these were things that, you know, these were, this is a book that we all agreed on, you know, as I say, 20 minutes ago in our culture, but now everything is boom, very quickly. So we'll leave it at that. But I charge you, okay, I charge you, says the text, uh, in the presence of God. There's kind of an oath formula here. Look, God is watching, my brother. I, I got my hand raised, and I'm charging you, and God is a witness. I'm telling you right now, I want you, uh, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead. Timothy, your last judgment is going to depend on whether you do this. Hmm? Your last judgment is going to depend on whether or not you do this. So how could I ever stand before God in my last judgment and, and say to him, well, I, I was just too much trouble for me to teach about the church's teachings on sexuality or marriage or the biblical teaching on, on, uh, on life or, you know, it was really controversial to mention racism or greed, you know, and I just didn't want to get in a lot of trouble. But I, I, I took good care of him. Lord, I mean, I paid all the bills and I kept the, the front grass mowed and the church looked real pretty, 
Um, do I get any credit for that? Nope. <laughs> Cause job one, you know, is to preach the gospel and, um, everybody liked me though. Everybody liked me. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, says the Lord, for thus did their fathers treat the false prophets. But Lord, I was like really popular. <laughs> he says, well, look at me. I ended up on a cross. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's not the goal. All right. So you see, see what happens to us if we're not careful. So we have to, uh, so he, he, here now in the very presence of God, God the Father with Christ Jesus our Lord, he is charging Timothy and Christ will be our judge. Listen, Timothy, I'm charging you. I'm, I'm asking you to not just, I'm not just charging you. I'm telling you to charge the people. That is to say, to summon them if necessary to a martyrdom for this word. Okay, good. So I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's the judge living in the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Now look at that by his appearing and his kingdom. Now, <clears throat> there's going to come a day, y'all, of judgment. And um, the, uh, sometimes this is called, you know, the parousia. Um, the, um, um, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, the parousia means it's, it's the second coming of the Lord. And I'm just looking up the Greek word here, his appearing. No, okay, this is the word where we get uh, epiphanean, okay, the, where we get the word epiphany, right? But the, his manifestation or his appearing and of the kingdom of him. The, uh, the, so <clears throat> notice again, he's appealing to the end things, though, when Christ shall appear again, come again in glory, he shall appear and his whole kingdom with all of its values and all of its people will be standing one day before the world to make a judgment upon this world. So which side are you on, boy? Remember that old civil rights song? Which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on? My Lord, which side are you on? Okay, you, you. so are you in the kingdom or are you out of the kingdom? Is you a saint or is you an ain't? It's gonna, ha one day you're gonna, Christ is gonna come with his whole kingdom and you're either gonna be in or you're gonna be out. And the decision is yours. I'm charging you. I'm, I'm calling you to a martyrdom and to call people to a martyrdom to preach this word um, because Christ is going to come again in all of his glory. And you're either going to be in the kingdom or out of the kingdom. And the people you know and love and are preaching to will either be in or they'll be out. See? So this is all very, it's a very solemn sort of oath formula here, appealing not just to the presence of God, but also to his glorious second coming, when you'll either be on the winning team or the losing team, and there's no third team, and there's no sidelines. You're on one team or you're on the other. There's an old saying in Latin, tertium non datur, no, no third way is given, okay? You got, you got two teams on the field, and it's all you got, two sides. And by the way, you already know ahead of time which team's going to win. Uh, by the way, so I want to give you a hint. Jesus, he's going to win. Now, why be stupid? Just choose the winning team and try to stay with Jesus. Choose the winning team. Now, it's amazing to me, again, how many people, but of course, you have to have faith to accept that you know the winning team and so on. I get that. But the point is that coming into faith, you know, we've already been told who's going to win. You know the end of the story. I, I mean, I, I will tell you, I did cheat, you know. I went to the end of the book and I looked it up. Wow, oh, Jesus wins. <laughs> you know, my grandmother would love to read mystery novels. Um, and uh, she'd always go to the end of the book and read the solution first. I said, but, but grandma, that's cheating. She goes, but it helps me understand the book. I said, well, all right. So I learned that you read the Bible backwards. You start with the victory of Jesus and you realize, look at all this mess we went through. But at the end, God wins, and everyone who's with him, all the saints, oh, when the saints <laughs> go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Another old spiritual says, in that great getting up morning, fare you well, fare you well. Oh, fare you well, poor sinner. Fare you well. Well, look out now. I'm having some church up in here. All right. <laughs> Welcome to Holy Comforter. St. Cyprian <laughs> on, on a typical Sunday morning. Okay. All right. Me, reading on. Here comes the key word now. He says, with, with all of this background, this oath formula, he says here, preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Now, um, let me just, again, just double checking my, uh, my text here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting, the Greek word here is uh, karikson. It, it comes from the Greek root word, as, as I recall, karux, which means not just to be like a teacher, but it means a herald or a town crier. You know, the image of a karux in, in, in Greek is, is again, like I say, it's very vivid, it's a strong, it's a town crier who goes in the town square and he says, behold, I bring you great tidings of glad joy, which will be for all the people. I bring you a word from Caesar himself. And he cries out in the town and people gather around and he almost sings the message out. So this is the image of a, of, of a, a karux, a, a, a herald, a, 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 a town crier. That, that's the image of this Greek word. So he says to Timothy, um, you know, karuxan, you know, preach. Uh, but not just, you know, okay, today we read and we're reading today and there are three ways of understanding this and uh, let's try to, you know, I think I told you every sermon I ever heard growing up in three sentences. Are you ready? <clears throat> Jesus is challenging us to do better today. Let us try to do better. Now, please stand for the creed. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Now, I don't want to pick on them all. There were some good, there were some good priests growing up, but too much of it was like that, you know. So this, you see how different this word is from that? Not preach like that, but preach, shout, proclaim, enthusiastically announce this word that you, you've heard. And, it's, and, and here comes the other aspect of, you've heard me on this before. The word gospel, evangelion, was actually a word that was related to these town criers. Um, euangelion in the Greek word or evangelium in the Latin referred to an edict, some dictator's edict from the emperor. Um, so, and they called that they called it uh, uh, an evangelion or euangelion in the Greek. Now, therefore, the town crier would come and shout this word out, this euangelion. Now, um, very often the word. Um, Gospel, Evangelion is where we also get the word gospel. If I were to ask you, what does gospel mean? Most of you would probably say good news. But you see, that's not really, that doesn't really capture, it's not necessarily always good news. Um, you know, every now and again, you you know, like last Sunday's gospel. If any of you comes to me and doesn't hate their father, mother, son, daughter, you know, who loves their father, son, daughter more than me, they can't be worthy of me. You know, the gospel of the Lord. Uh, does that sound like good news? You know, I mean, it, it, it's not, okay, it's good news because it's true, but really the, the essence of this word evangelion, where we get the word gospel, is life-changing news, see. It may be good news, it may also be bad news, but either way, it's going to change your life. So here's an example. I've given you this before, but, you know, I find that I have to repeat myself. So um, let's um, say the town choir will come, and he will, he will sound out the he would, he would usually begin the karux or the town crier, the herald would shout, he'd pull open the scroll, he says, behold, I bring you great tidings of glad joy, which will be for all the people. Does that sound like something in the, in the Bible? Isn't that what the angels shouted out? Okay, so that's the formula for a new evangelion. I bring you great tidings of glad joy, which will be for all the people. The emperor is raising taxes. Now, that doesn't seem like good news, right? The, th the point isn't that it's good news. Whatever the emperor wants is good news, though, right? Come on. Hey, admit it, right? Whatever the emperor wants has to be good news. No, of course not. But, um, but it's life-changing, isn't it? Your, your life just changed. It's this word that you just heard proclaimed is going to change your life. Now, here comes a better example with good news. Behold, the town crier shouts out, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, um, which will be for all the people. Hmm? For the, uh, the emperor is about to pave the road now between Laodicea and Ephesus. That's good news, and it's also life-changing news, because now it's going to be a lot easier to go from Laodicea to Ephesus. Hallelujah. Good news. See, so you see, the essence of this word evangelion, which the karux, the, the, the town crier would announce, was not always necessarily pleasant in the sense of good or pleasant news, but it was life-changing. Now, back to this. This word preach, karux, huh? Be like a town crier who shouts out this life-changing message for God's people to hear. Preach, be like the town crier, be like the the uh, be like the great herald of, of 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 news and so on. The one who would go about the town 
summoning people to hear the news from the next town over, okay? So, do you, so it's a vivid picture again, isn't it, right? So you see again, if you, if you know a little bit of the Greek here, you start to see there's a vividness to it that is sometimes not always immediately available to us in our own native language, okay? Not that there's anything wrong with um, English, but sometimes because we speak it every day, we sort of miss the subtleties, you know? And sometimes when you read something in another language, say, oh, I missed that. Oh, look at, the, look at this word they've been using. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. And so that's why it's good to sometimes know Greek, or even if you just know Spanish, and you want to read, read, the, read this letter in Spanish. I know Latin. I pick up things when I read it in Latin that I don't know, that I don't see and when I read it in English. So always a good idea. Okay, so now look here. It says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Now, again, what does that tell you? The gospel is going to go in and out of season. Um, there are times where, you know, things are in the gospel are very either popular or generally thought of as, uh, you know, acceptable. And other times it isn't. Now, like, right, let's just look at right now. There are certain things in the gospel that are very popular and very uncontroversial, like feeding the poor, um, clothing the naked, you know, things like uh, being just to the oppressed. Um, these things are generally not controversial. They're rather popular now, but but when it comes to um, some of the teachings on sexuality or the fact that uh, God has absolute authority over when we live and when we die, um, these things are less popular today and uh, they're scorned. So it's been my experience that it's not like the entire gospel all, all, all together goes out of season and, and then comes back into season, but that there are many elements of the gospel that go out of season, right? And what does he say? Preach anyway preach them in season and out of season, okay? So uh, we have then a, um, um, uh, you know, this, this call, this call to be, um, um, you know, um, like I say, uh, consistent in our preaching of the gospel, whether it is popular or unpopular. You've probably heard the expression um, that, um, um, what is it, not, not everything that is popular is right, and not everything that is, that is right is popular. So, um, we have to say again, always, we're going to just always be in times when certain things um, in the gospel just go out of fashion, right? They just go out of fashion. Okay. Now he, he talks about here, he says, be ready uh, to in season and out of season. Okay. So, um, um, you know, and then he goes on and he says here, my, my, I'm going from my translation, convict rebuke and exhort i think your translation liz said what um convince is it preach the word oh uh reprove rebuke and exhort okay so um or, oh convince oh rebuke, and exhort okay and so it's interesting all these different translations of this greek word huh yeah so what's interesting is um to reprove um, it, it sort of involves a kind of a punitive thing, right? Um, but it, but really, what it, it what this Greek word means, which is a which is a lingo, it means to sort of expose something as false, to show that it's it's not worthy, you know, of of our of our allegiance. See, so there's a at the heart of the word is to expose something. Um, um, as, as in false or negative or not in conformity, you know, with the truth. So um, that's why there's all these different approaches, I think, to translating. You know, in other words, this one where convict people that that's, that, that is a wrong idea. Or you, yours again says, Liz, what word again? What's uh, oh, re uh, a... Convince, it? rebuke, and exhort. Yeah. The now, convince is a rather maybe overly positive way of putting it because it is a negative word. You're trying to, you, you're, you're trying to, you know, um, not just convince, but show something that somebody's, something's wrong. So maybe the word convince in its original form, conquer it with the truth. So, so again, the, one of the tasks of preaching is to say, you've heard that it was said in the world, but I tell you, that's a wrong way of thinking. You've heard that you were made for riches. You're not made for riches. You've heard that you were made for popularity and power and prestige and beauty. You've heard all these things, 
But none of these things will last. None of these things are why you were made. You were made to know and love the Lord and serve him in this life and then be happy with him one day forever in heaven. Whatever beauty you have, whatever wealth you have, whatever you think you have, it's all going away. Say bye-bye. Money talks. Mine says bye. Uh, it, it's, all, it's all going away. Only what you do for Christ will last. You see, so you're taking an idea that the world says you're great if you're rich. You're great if you're good looking. You're great if you stay thin. You never gain a pound. You're great if you, you name it. You know, you just put in your own. Uh, and uh, and uh, we have to say that's, that's wrong. Reprove that. Um, expose it as the lie that it is. Okay? Because I know lots of people who have all those things. They got good looks. They got money. They got a big house. They got a fancy car. And they're not happy. And I know people that don't have a lot of those things. And they're happy. So there's a lie. It's a lie, you see. But you see the idea. This is what it means then uh, in, this, in this word. So part of the teaching and preaching task is to show that many of the dogmas of the world are false. Okay? So that's the first thing we see, uh, that we are to, uh, uh, as I say here, convict or convince or to reprove. Next thing we are to rebuke. Now, rebuke again indicates some kind of... Um, uh, to, like, what's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a punishment. In other words, uh, that there's a certain, you, you meet out a certain censure or a, um, you, 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 you chide, you admonish. Uh, in some way, you seek to um, bring, well, the word punishment may be too strong, but you want to have a person see how wrong they are about something. Okay, is 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 at the heart of it, um, and uh, it's very close to the um, Greek word for epistemos, which means kind of a theory of knowledge. You're trying to show them that their thinking is false, and there's a certain embarrassment that goes with that, which is what's meant by reproof. And so, in other words, your parents and, and most of you, and 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 many of you are our grandparents, that if you never chide. If you never rebuke, you just say, well, dear, that's wrong for the following life reasons. Okay, have a nice day. Um, you know, you're not going to get very far with your kids. Sometimes you've got to say, that's wrong, and I don't want to hear that come out of your mouth again. Now, my mother would tell me, if I hear that come out of your mouth again, I'm going to wash out your mouth with soap. Now, mostly that was an empty threat. She almost never did. But I did, on two occasions, get my mouth washed out with soap. She, can, she brought me to the sink and put soap in my mouth. <laughs> right. uh, I learned not to say certain words <laughs> or to have certain re certain things against, you know, uh, her or my father. Um, and uh, so that's the kind of the, re the idea of, um, you know, reproving um, somebody. Okay. I'm sorry, rebuking, rebuking. Okay. And then it says, uh, so, uh, you know, against to reprove, to rebuke. And then here's a more positive image, right? To exhort. Now, this is a much more positive. You see, if all the preacher does is harangue people and bang his fist on the table and try to win an argument with them, you know, he's going to be in trouble, see? There are times where this must be done, where we must call out the falsities and the lies of this world for what they are, and we must, ex you know, command people to come away from these teachings or suffer due penalties. But there also, though, comes a time when we also have to teach with great love, and we have to um, allow the Lord to um, work in in us and through us in a much more, you know, positive way, um, so that, um, um, uh, and, the, and the Greek word here is paraklason, which is uh, where we get the word paraclete, you know, like a teacher, um, but a paraclete is more than a teacher, a paraclete is like someone who helps you, like a legal, it's one of the words that are used for like a lawyer, um, a parakletos, someone who accompanies you to a trial or that will represent you uh, before officials. Uh, they're alongside to give you help and advice and encouragement. So the word paraclete, uh, meaning to exhort uh, in the sense of in a helpful way with good advice, good counsel. So we have a couple of strong, maybe negative words coupled with a rather a positive word. So with that in mind, what should good preaching do? It should, it should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And we're all in a little bit of both categories, right? We sometimes need a little bit of both. So someone will come to me after mass and say, Whoa, Father, you were stepping on my toes today. Hmm? 
And I said, well, I hope, uh, I hope it was a, a good dance. Not, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't stomping on him, was I? I said, no, you weren't stomping, but you just stepped on my toes a little today, you know? So that's a way of saying, you know, whoops, uh, I think I need to make a couple changes here. But it's, 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 it's the nice thing about it is it's, it's a friendly, ex you know, re re from, the, from the person saying, you, you, you corrected me, but you reached me in a good way. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to hear this so I can base my life. And the goal then isn't to make people angry or to win an argument, even though sometimes we do have to be very strong because if, if we're not strong at times, people don't really take it seriously. So, but on the other hand, if that's all we do, we're in trouble. So we wanna always do this parakletos, we're alongside, we're walking with them as, as our Pope loves to talk about, we're accompanying them hmm? um, and, uh, and things like that, okay, all right. Now, maybe a couple more things and I'm going to get any responses or questions from you, okay? Um, do this with complete patience and teaching. Now, we're just going to develop this idea of teaching, but he says do it with uh, complete patience. Now, um, let's see here. You know, makrothumia is the Greek word, right? So, um, yeah, just ba it's basically just patience. I mean, there isn't really a lot of uh, subtleties that I could bring out there. But, but macro, uh, thymos means passion or anger, and makros means long. So in other words, literally, makrothumia means long suffering. So that you're, you're willing to suffer at length. You don't, you don't, you don't say, well, that's enough of that. Now I'm going to hit you. You know, I mean, um, we, where we have a short temper or a short fuse. We, to be makrothumia means to be, have a, an ability to suffer over a long period of time to stay in a long conversation with a person that doesn't quickly give up or quickly uh, just rebuke and, and walk away, okay? So that's the insight. And, uh, and then with, with, uh, with proper teaching, you know, proper doctrine. Don't, um, don't preach anything other than the sound doctrine of our Lord, right? Um, um, at the end of the day, there is a, a content to the faith that we have to respect. And there are, there are false teachers, there are false prophets who walk around and they are saying things and teaching things that are not of God. And he's going to develop that more in a moment. So um, let's stop for a minute um, and get any reactions or questions, comments, rebukes, rebuttals, and maybe a little bit of, um, uh, just may maybe a little bit of uh, parakletos too, all right? Looks like George is trying to unmute there. Okay. Okay. Well, he froze. Well, while you, while, while uh, you, um, good. I muted my. I had a comment about um, some of the conversations I've had in class, RCI A classes, and other sessions of how, being the long, um, long suffering and and patience and dealing with young adults mm -hmm. and um, their challenging their parameters and going forth. And one of the comments I've, I've kind of like summed it all up, I've had to share with them is sometimes you have to allow young people to suffer the consequences of their choices. Uh, and you have to stand firm in what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't, you, the truth and what is right is going to be the same every single day. Mm -hmm. And you have to allow them to suffer that consequence of that choice or they'll never change. You can't keep saving an adult or young adult from that consequence. If, if they, they keep no, uh, knowing you're going to come in and fix everything, yeah. they're not going to stop doing it. And that's a hard pill for some parents and grandparents to swallow. Yeah. Because they see these young adults uh, with children and out of wedlock mm. and, uh, or they're unemployed because they, uh, or unemployable because they didn't, fin they didn't finish high school or that's all they have is a high school education and they want, you know, not, you know, you know, all yeah. the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if they, don't make a choice to do something better for themselves and you keep giving them money and you you keep supplementing their bad choices they're not going to have a reason to do anything different yeah 
So anyway, that's that's what my I father, um, When my brother was um, was younger and was raising kids, and his kids, his sons were much younger. My my father gave him some advice. You know, he said uh, he says George. He says sometimes uh, sometimes you know kids need to make their own mistakes. You know, and of course you have to watch and be careful. You don't want, don't want to make a terrible, miserable, you know, life changing mistake. But you're you're right. You know, we have to sometimes let people make their own mistakes, suffer some of the consequences. It's a way of learning. It is. As you know, the word discipline in English has kind of two connotations. One is a sort of a punishment, but discipline also means teaching. I'm studying the discipline of medicine, or you get the idea. So um, the, the word discipline, learning, goes together with discipline in, this, in the other more negative sense. And there is a school of hard knocks, as I think it's called. Yes. All right. Good. Well, we'll move on, but notice again, you see, he says, now you gotta, you gotta have this kind of commitment. These, these are all very strong words, in, and especially as we began, that word, you know, uh, I charge you, you know, uh, martyron, you know, the, I, I summon you to a kind of a holy martyrdom. Why? Well, here we come up for the reason. The reason is this, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine or te you know, sound teaching but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, this, again, you say, well, gosh, that's certainly true in our time. It was certainly true in Paul's time. It's a human problem. It isn't just, you know, unique to our, our current age, um, although it's, it's very much more um, on display today. Why? Well, because of, of forums like this, where we can reach all, literally all across the world. And if I wanted to spout error, I could get on and easily start, you know, getting, I could reach a lot of people and it would be very visible and obvious. And um, so there's, in a way, we, we, it's much more facilitated today that there are people who surround themselves with teachers who tickle their ears. So, you know, you, you craft your Facebook friends, you unfriend people who don't, you don't like and don't agree with you. And you friend people who you do like and agree with you. And then the same with Twitter and you know, these are the ways that people kind of, you know, they start living in little bubbles that they create for themselves. And um, they, um, it's nice to have all this diversity, but the problem is that too easily you can begin to fall into an echo chamber. And then we also have this problem today where people feel like they have a perfect right to invent their own God and worship it. Now, we used to call that idolatry, uh, but people today feel like they have a perfect right to sort of envision the God of my understanding, uh, the God within. And that, by the way, this God just happens to agree with me and just about everything. And he knows that I'm really right. Unlike your dumb God. Um, and uh, never mind that our, our God, you know, put his stuff in writing, you know, paper has perfect recall and it's kind of like objectively there and you can't kind of make it up. You see, either you take it or leave it. But you see a lot of people say, well, heck with that. I need to have a designer God. And again, we used to call this idolatry. And um, it's, it's a sin it's against the first commandment. But you see, you see that today it becomes increasingly possible to surround ourselves with teachers who tickle our ears, who say what our itching ears want to hear. And, uh, ooh, Father James Martin says it's all really okay. Let me follow him and unfollow Father Pope who says it's not okay. You know, and that you, you see what starts to happen. So people will not tolerate sound doctrine. They will not tolerate it. Now, this word is important. Today, this word tolerance is often used, but it's most often misused. So um, the, uh, the idea generally of, of tolerance is kind of a lie, right? Because basically tolerance becomes your right to agree with me. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you're, you're a hater, you're mean, you're, you're, and so on. Or when, when people start to hate the truth, the truth starts to sound hateful. And uh, when people stop tolerating the truth, the truth sounds intolerant. You know, I could keep reversing these things, but you get the point. So we tend to project these ideas. Originally, tolerance is, a, is, is actually a very beautiful virtue. It's basically when I don't agree with you, but for a greater reason, maybe for family peace or because it's not really worth trying to, you know, make force you to believe in something, um, I just go ahead and say, well, I mean, you know, we'll stay neighbors and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll look, kind of live and let live. But today, tolerance usually means you have to agree with me, otherwise you're intolerant. If you don't agree with me, you're intolerant. Whereas that's, that's the complete opposite of what tolerance meant. I don't agree with you, 
But because I don't want police officers running into your bedroom and telling you what you can, can and can't do with another person, I, I, I'll overlook this legally, but I, I, I'm, I'm not agreeing with what you're doing. God says it's wrong. Or maybe there's um, someone who, uh, you know, as I say, they're of a different faith. Uh, this guy over here is in the Baha'i religion or whatever. And I think he's all wrong about that, but I'll, I'll tolerate that is to say, I, I don't agree with his views, but for the sake of religious liberty and something that we all need to kind of get along, um, I'll overlook some of that and try to, you know, stay friendly and maybe even convert him at some point. But so that's that's the nature of tolerance. But it's come to mean that you have to agree with what I'm doing. Otherwise, you're intolerant. And that's completely the opposite of what tolerance is supposed to mean. OK, but he is saying here that people will not tolerate sound doctrine. In other words, Okay, so people, let's just say that there's a lot of people out there that don't like the Catholic Church, and they don't like what we teach, or they don't like the Bible, and they don't like what it teaches. Okay, so we're going to have a nice day. I'm so sorry you don't like it, but they're not, that's not, they don't even want to tolerate it. They want to destroy this. They want to do, remove the voice of God. Prayer has got to go out of the schools. Prayer has to be removed from the public square, remove it from any public setting, any references to God or to Jesus or the Bible, or if you're, if you're using any biblical quotes anywhere, these things should be chiseled off. I mean, this is where, you know, things are beginning to head, you see, in our culture. I'm waiting for the day when all those towns in California need to be renamed, that are named after saints, you know, like Santa Barbara, Santa Clara, Santa Monica, San Francisco. I mean, I could go on and on, you know. Even the state capital, Sacramento, <laughs> the most blessed sacrament. <laughs> you know, I mean, but increasingly there are, you know how they, they did this in Russia, you know, they, do, they would rename towns like St. Petersburg was renamed Leningrad because they were removing any Christian influence. And increasingly, not now, but we're getting there little by little, um, where it's, it is, is the, the presence of the religious voice is not even to be tolerated uh, in our culture. Now, we won a good Supreme Court decision here a couple of weeks. We've actually done a pretty good job of winning Supreme Court decisions on religious liberty issues. So we still have a lot of constitutional protections. But, you know, I'm telling you right now, uh, you and I remember a time when it was a lot easier to pray in public. And um, certainly, I, I, I remember praying in the public school. Back in, in, the, in the late 60s, down in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Mr. Bowell, he had, uh, he said, yeah, we in my school, we're still praying. Now, they say we're not supposed to be praying in school. Well, in my school, we still pray. Now, everyone, you stand on up now, and we're going to read from the King James Bible. Yes, he read from the King James Bible. And we always, you know, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. You know, and, and he said, now, all y'all say with me, our Father who art in heaven, we prayed that, and we did the Pledge of Allegiance. And we were, he says, now, God bless you all and have a holy day. <laughs> he turned off the microphone. Uh, and that was completely illegal in 1968. <laughs> because I think it was 1965, they removed prayer from the public schools, you see. Anyway, my only point in saying all this is, you see, these, these are the kinds of things where people don't even want to hear it. They, they won't tolerate it. It must be removed completely. And that's increasingly in stages where things have headed. So let's not underestimate this word, this word tolerant. They will not even tolerate, they will not even tolerate, you know, this, the, this, the presence of this. You know, you can teach people how to wear condoms in public school. You can even teach them about Muhammad, but you cannot teach them about Jesus or bring a Bible and read from it. You just can't do that. You, that's, uh, George. Monsignor. Mm -hmm. um, then what you're saying is that when people know that near death, you know, and um, there are things out there that can actually, you're going to perish. You, you're going to the, the end. Then they come out with, well, I believe in God, but, mm -hmm. but you have wandered away yeah. and you're believing in all these different myths. I mean, right. you know what I'm saying? Is it, is it going to come a time where they just want to do away with the Bible itself? I mean, yeah. You know what certainly, it certainly has happened um, in other places in the world. And yeah, but I mean, you, do you think that based on what we're going through now, 
if that's what's going to come to. I mean, I, I can't envision that, but it, it seems very, very, um, right. very intimate. That it's, it's almost like something's going to happen, but you don't want that to happen. I mean, because the belief is if we have faith and if we keep our faith, mm. things will change. Yeah. That's the way it's always been. I mean, right. I, and, well, and George, I don't, I don't like, uh, I hate fear mongering. Um, and uh, so I'm not trying to be a fear monger, but I'm just saying that there's been a fairly steady erosion in our culture exactly. in the last 70 exactly. years of the influence of religion. And some of that has been legally forced. And if that continues, there could come a time. But I, I don't envision a sudden dramatic decline of any and all religious okay. practice in this country, um, okay. unless there's a complete change of government. But I, I think that um, when I mean change of government, I don't just mean a different president. I mean change of government. Over exactly. Here. Okay. Some kind of a Thank Marxist you. thing. You know. And so, yeah, yeah, I would put it that way. So okay. um, now, um, let's see here. Yeah, the, so the text says here that, again, they will turn away from listening to the truth. Hmm? Um, and uh, they will, um, they will um, uh, wander off into myths. They'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, some of you maybe seem less aware of this than I, than I personally am, but have you noticed um, that on the Science Channel and the um, History Channel that there's a lot of these weird uh, shows now about ancient astronaut theory? And that the it was asked ancient aliens who came and actually built the pyramids and you know so they like to laugh at our talking snake in the book of genesis oh those silly christians with their talking snake and here they are talking about little green men who came and built the pyramids um what i, I don't mean to ridicule but my point is that there's no evidence for this they, they like to try to find it um but the, but the, the idea is they laugh at our you know, sacred scriptures, but don't see that they've just, we need explanations. People look for explanations. And when you throw away God's explanation, you start to come up with a lot of crazy stuff you're, of your own. See, G.K. Chesterton said that when men stop believing in God, it's not that they believe in nothing, but that they'll believe in anything. See? And so I think it's amazing to me how many of those shows have proliferated on the Science Channel and the, um, and the uh, History Channel about little green men, basically, who came in these, you know, these spacecraft and visited our ancestors. And, you know, you could ask, well, why didn't they stay? Uh, why did they build crude buildings like pyramids? Um, where, where, where's the higher degree of technology uh, that, that it took to get here? Um, you know, where are their glass spaceships? And, you know, you get the idea. So. One, one thing, Father. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, Monsignor. You my father was stationed in Roswell, New Mexico. Oh, yeah, yeah. That... And guess where he worked? <laughs> Area 54 or whatever it yes, is. Right? He did. Yes, he did. <laughs> and, and so you have no... told you what he did, did he'd have to kill you. <laughs> right, exactly. You, you have no idea the many years that people ask me, your father worked where? Roswell, yeah. New Mexico? He was in the Air Force? You mean, he was there. Yeah. He saw them. And I'm like, he saw what? <laughs> but, but I just wanted to put that there. You know. Nothing to see here. Move along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, listen, I'm not here to poke fun at things, but I'm just saying to you that, um, uh, by the way, we don't present a talking snake in the book of Genesis. We don't know what the serpent looked like when before before uh, at, before god cursed it, it, it but it, it didn't seem odd to eve that a serpent was talking to her so it may not have been a snake okay whatever the serpent looked like um before original sin god cursed it and forced it to slither on the ground and eat dirt all the rest of its days so again you know there's their ridicule doesn't even show a sophistication of our understanding uh, of our own scriptures but anyway all that aside when you, when you turn away from sound doctrine, you open yourself up to all kinds of foolishness and myths and, and crazy things. And I've noticed people who, leave, priests and others who leave the church and set up like uh, George Stallings. I don't know if any remember him, but um, he separated himself from the church and with, he got weirder and weirder and he started hanging around with Sun Young Moon and you know, all this crazy stuff. And uh, he became uh, just stranger and stranger as, as it went. And uh, 
Um, I, I don't, I'm not here to personally tell you his whole story, but I've seen this happen over and over again, that when people pull themselves away from the anchor of truth, they, they very quickly fall into lots of confused thinking. And it's a very, often a very quick and a steep decline. Okay. So, all right. Well, we're not exactly making, oh yes, uh, Ellen. Oh, I just was going to say kind of back with what George was saying. Um, you know, Pope Francis was saying that one of his favorite books is The Lord of the World. Wow, oh, yeah. And, right. um, and I read that book. And I know that, yeah, I just think that that book, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I just really enjoyed it because it was uh, so simple, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the end. Um, because, uh, you know, as long as someone's saying mass somewhere you know mm -hmm. but it was it was just i don't know there was something about that book i thought was really interesting because i feel like it sort of touches on the different things we're you know kind of talking about because how weird everything can get and how dark everything can get and how mm -hmm. um you know it's hard to put those things into words that's why i think it's such a great book because it's sort of a story that um you know gives you these ideas about things that you can recognize and you know i don't know you know mm -hmm. so it's indeed okay it's a very good book if you haven't read it. It's called The Lord of the World by Monsignor Hugh Benson. And it basically depicts a kind of dystopian future where the faith is, uh, you know, uh, sent underground in effect. And um, there's a lot of suffering that the faith will have. And uh, large uh, atheistic governments uh, take over. And, um, you know, that's, it largely happened in Eastern Europe, didn't it? See? And so it's not like it couldn't happen anywhere else. Remember what happened in Mexico back about 120 years ago, the Cristero movement. That was a Catholic country, and um, they, um, the church was outlawed for a period of years, you know, when, the, when, a, when, a, when an atheist had government. Look what happened in Cuba, again, another Catholic country. These are very close to us, right, right over the border, so to speak, uh, just 90 miles offshore from Florida. So it, it's not like these things could never happen here, but I'm not being a fear monger. I think we just have to keep sober and alert that there are going to be some who will simply no longer tolerate the sound doctrine and will continue to fight and seek to legally limit and, and punish our religious expression. And call, they'll, they'll call it things like hate speech. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll refer to it um, in, in, in terms like that and bigotry and homophobia or what have you. You see, this is going to be, uh, what is it, transphobic and all this kinds of stuff. They, they, they come up with these, they coin these terms and they're meant to, and not only disgrace us, but also to uh, fear, to make people fearful of us so that people will be increasingly willing to see our right to express our faith uh, limited because it's an aggression or it makes me feel unsafe um, and so on. You know, or we look at our colleges, you know, they used to be bastions of free speech. And now there's the exact opposite where these safe zones exist and you, the list of things you can't say on a college campus and the list of things you do have to say. Um, is is growing ever, ever longer. So look to the colleges if you want to know where we're going to be in another 15, 20 years and look at what those kids are talking like and sounding like. And um, okay, well, enough said. Now, um, what we want to do here is move into the next section where he says here, um, the, um, but as for you, verse five now, as for, oh, by the way, they will turn away from the faith is, is uh, the, Greek, the Greek word is there is a word you're, you're fairly familiar with. Um, and that's um, apost you know, apostre ap apostrepho, which where we get the word apostasy, right? Where one perverts or turns away or, or, or walks away from the faith that they once held. Okay, so you can't be an apostate if you're an atheist. Um, but if you once were a Catholic or a Christian and you renounce it, you become an apostate, right? Apo meaning like, in, in Greek, means like away is an intensifier. Away with that, right? Uh, and strefo means to turn away, right? So to turn. So to turn away or, or to uh, strongly denounce and walk away from something, okay? So that's, the, uh, that's a word that uh, you, you are already familiar with in, in, uh, in the English. Now, as we move, though, into the next verse, he says here that, again, you, however, be sober, um, in all things, endure afflictions, um, the, um, uh, the, the work, do, do, doing the work of an evangelist, um, and carry out your ministry, fulfill your ministry. So what's the prescription in a world that just rejects the faith, that doesn't want to hear of it, 
that doesn't want to accept it, that wants to even legally proscribe it, that will maybe punish, even kill you for saying it. What is the mission then? Run, hide, find a better place to go where they're more friendly? No. You, however, stay there sober, endure these afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, keep teaching, even if they kill you for it. See, that's the, um, that's the prescription. So, Cardinal uh, Worrell, some time ago, uh, I know it's not real popular to mention him, but uh, he did have a few things, good things to say, but they were asking him, you know, well, what do we need to do about this? And, uh, he, you know, the, in one of our priest meetings, and he said, my brothers, just keep teaching and never give up. Teach, teach, teach. Ultimately, the truth will out. We've seen so many of these errors come and go, and here we still are, you know, so that's, that's good advice. You know, it's, it's easy to become discouraged. It really is, you know. And you think everything seems lost. But remember, at a discouraging moment in Elijah's life, and he went and hid in the cave, and God finally came to him and said, Elijah, what are you doing here, man? He says, oh, woe is me. I, I, I'm, the only, I'm the only one left who believes in you, Lord. He, goes, he said, get up, man. He says, I got 7,000 back there in Jerusalem that never bent the knee to Baal, and I want you to go and take care of them and appoint a successor. So, in other words, God still has his 7,000, to put it you know, in those kinds of languages, right? Right, okay. So, now, um, he says here, be sober. Now, the Greek word uh, here is nepho, or, uh, and it means to be not drunk. It has that meaning, but it also has this meaning, to be, to be calm, circumspect. In other words, aware of what's going on around me. So, to be sober isn't just to be free of wine or strong liquor. To be sober is to have a clear mind, a calm mind that knows what's going on and, and has a kind of a confidence in the truth. So do you see, again, it's more than just not being drunk. It's, it's having a good, clear mind that can see what's really going on and calmly assess the situation, okay? So um, that's the, um, we need to rescue the word from a merely negative uh, image and, and keep it, uh, you know, keep it for our, um, because now I've, uh, I've somehow I've lost all your beautiful faces. I've got to find you. I must find you. Where have you all gone? On my computer screen here. Anyway, well, okay. How about this? Yeah, here we go. There you are. Hi again. Okay. I was just looking up um, my Greek text there, and I, I lost the uh, I lost your, your your beautiful faces. Okay. So to be sober, um, it says here um, for you, as I say, um, uh, be sober minded. Uh, endure suffering. Be willing to suffer. Okay. But, but, but they might not like me if I say this. But, but I'm, I might, if, if I confront my boss and say that I can't do this because I'm a Christian and I think it's, it's immoral, I, I might get fired. Um, my kids might laugh at me or, the, or I might not be the most popular parent on the block. Or, um, gosh, you know, um, they said that if I... Um, I'm the graduation, I'm the graduation of valedictorian, and they told me not to mention God. Uh, I might get in trouble uh, if I mention God. Uh, um, you know, I, you know, and so you start to see, these are the things that go through people's mind. And um, um, I was told one time to go to the Laurels. Uh, Laurel, I lived in Laurel, Maryland for an all of nine months at St. Mary's in Laurel. And the mayor of the town asked me to come and say the prayer for the of dedication of the Christmas tree. And she says, look, she says, I'm a Jew. I'd rather you not mention Jesus. Please don't mention him. Uh, I said, do you want me to come and bless a Christmas tree and not mention Jesus? And she says, yeah, you know, this is an inclusive event, you know, just, just talk about God. She said, well, what about the atheists? Are they not being included? You know I mean? What are we supposed to say? Well, just come and say a few good words, father. And I said, no, I, I'm not under those circumstances. I will not. I will not offer this prayer because it is a Christ mass tree. <laughs> you know? And if you don't want any religion in your public square, you better take the whole tree down, frankly. And uh, she didn't take kindly to it, and my pastor at the time wasn't happy that I replied that way. And uh, but at the end of the day, I suffered. <laughs> so, here's another funny story. There was a kid, uh, and if it's not true, it's a story that ought to be true. There was a kid that was told not to mention God. He's the valedictorian, and he was told not to mention God uh, in his valedictorian speech. So he got up there, 
And he goes, <clears throat> my dear brothers and sisters. And then he went, ah, ah, achoo. And, this, and he, had, he had all these five guys in the uh, front aisle. That, were, that was their cue to stand up and say, God bless you. And he said, amen. <laughs> that was creative. That was very creative. <laughs> but anyway, you know, we have to be willing to endure some suffering. Uh, now, look, here's the, some, here's the thing I've noticed with people, too, because I think sometimes what happens to people is if somebody's angry with you, you think, oh, oh I did something wrong. But listen, and this is a very important truth to grasp, just because somebody's angry with you doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It might mean you did something right. Now, we don't look, that's not our goal to get somebody angry. But please, we've got to keep reminding ourselves that just because someone is angry with me or disappointed in me or it doesn't mean that I did something wrong. It might mean that they're in the wrong place or they're just not in a place to hear it, you know? So, and again, don't become a sociopath and say, I don't give a rip what anybody thinks and I'm never wrong, I'm always right. But on the other hand, you know, we have to also get over this other idea that just because somebody's upset or angry with me does not mean I did anything wrong, okay? All right. So somewhere along the line, we have to be willing to accept the fact that we're going to have to endure suffering, all right? And too many of us aren't willing to do that. And it starts with priests, okay? All right? Now, you don't go looking for trouble, but when you, when you have to sometimes talk to a son or a daughter who's shacked up and fornicating or not going to mass anymore, you're going to suffer. They're not going to like the fact that you mention these things. Um, when you have to at the Thanksgiving dinner, refuse to refer to Stephanie, who used to be Stephen, as Stephanie, you're going to suffer, okay? Um, there, are, there is suffering, if we are going to be honest about this stuff, and say, I'm sorry, Stephanie, you're Stephen, you've always been Stephen, and cutting your body up and doing things to yourself doesn't change a thing. It's not who God made you, okay? And that's an honest truth, you know? I had to take a family member aside at a Thanksgiving dinner and say, no, look, you see this thing, I'm a priest. And you know, you're dating a married woman. Cut it out. I love you, brother. I think you're my, you know, and I, he wasn't my brother, but I mean, I love you like a brother. Uh, and I hope you understand what I'm saying to you. I'm, I'm concerned for your salvation. If you die in repentance, you'll probably go to hell for that. See. And I won't say anything more about this. We're gonna go have a Thanksgiving dinner now, but I want you to know you heard it from me. And you, it's coming from God. And I'm telling you right now, you got to cut it out. All right. And I won't say another word to you. By the way, I said, she's beautiful. <laughs> but you got no business dating her. She's not for you. Okay. She says, I love your taste in women, though. <laughs> you know, you just jazz it up with a little bit of humor and you lighten it up. But you got to be clear. See? And I didn't really suffer a lot that day. But um, I felt kind of, it was heavy on me to have to talk to him like that, you know. So, and that's just part of what we got to expect. Okay, got to do it. All right. So, all right. <clears throat> now, he says here again, sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Okay. Remember, he's under an oath. I adjure you, I charge you by the living God and of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, okay, we, we said that uh, we're not exactly rip-roaring through this text. So, let's pick up a little speed here. Um, and um, uh, Paul himself goes on. Why don't you go ahead and read, Liz, the next um, verse, six, uh, verse 6 through uh, 8. Okay. For I am already on the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, had, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Okay, so what what Paul's saying here is that have an eschatological view. Look, you may suffer for a little while on this earth. But do you understand the victory that will come to you if you suffer for the Lord? You know, he's, what did he say in the Beatitudes? You know, 
How blessed you are when people hate you and persecute you and utter everything falsely against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. So we have to always have in mind that we're not just enduring suffering and having a miserable life trying to preach the gospel and, you know, we're all a bunch of losers and um, we're going to suffer and then we just die. But rather, we, if we are faithful in this way, we will hear from the Lord, well done, good and faithful servant, well done. Come now, enjoy your, your, the, the kingdom I've prepared for you from the foundation of the world, see? Um, we, we work for a reward, not so much, a, like I say, a reward in the sense of payment, but I mean, we have the reward in mind of what waits for those who are faithful and who will live this teaching and go out. And he says here, you know, I, he has no regrets. I fought the good fight. I, I've, I've done as much as I think I can reasonably do. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith, see? Uh, I never gave up. I kept preaching. I kept teaching. You know, sometimes there are discouraging results. There's lack of support. I still, I still preached. You know, at the end of the day, um, sometimes there's a, there's, a, there's a satisfaction in knowing, look, I, and anybody could say I could have done this or that one thing better. But the question is, over the course of my life, have I really fought the good fight? Have I really stri striven to follow the Lord myself in my own life and bring as many people along with me as I can? And that's got to be our goal. But remember, it's, there's going to be suffering, but there's also going to be a great reward laid up for you in heaven if you do it, see? And um, right now, I'll be honest with you, I'm in a place of a little bit of discouragement. Um, you know, as I see all, all the numbers of the, all, of, of the churches everywhere, you know, in the West anyway, dropping. Um, people turning away from the faith in droves. There's a great apostasy today. I mean, huge numbers who... Were raised Catholic, went through Catholic schools, have turned away from the faith. And some of you might be discouraged. You have family members and so on. Um, at times, I'm, I'm a little discouraged. But all I know is that I'm doing what God told me to do. And until he tells me to do something different, I'm going to do this. See, he gave me a vineyard. He gave me people to reach. I'm reaching you tonight. Keep it, get out there, preach, convince as many as you can, make their faith strong, help them to turn to make other people strong. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And remember that there's a great reward waiting for you if you do it. See? And um, so there's a little parable to tell you here. Um, you may have heard before. But there was uh, one day there was a man and there was this very large boulder. And God came by and said, see that boulder? And I says, I want you to start pushing on that. Push on it. And I'll, I'll be back. Uh, I'll be back, you know, after a little while. So he's pushing on it, pushing on it. Doesn't move that thing an inch. It doesn't even budget. And the Lord comes walking back after two weeks and says, and the guy says, how you doing? He, said, uh, the guy, he says to the guy, how you doing? Oh, I'm so discouraged. I haven't moved this thing an inch. He says, I didn't tell you to move it an inch. I told you to push on it. Well, what good would that do, Lord? He says, well, first of all, you obeyed me. Secondly, look at your muscles. You're stronger. Your back is stronger. Your muscles are, you're all, you got six pack abs. You're all ripped and looking, looking, you know, I mean, and you get the idea. That, that it, it isn't always going to be obvious, whatever successes that we've had, um, some of them are hidden. And I told you that I, I've reaped the reward of other people's prayers, you know, where the rectory doorbell rings or someone walks into the confessional after 40 years. You know, someone was praying for them, see. Um, likewise, I think in heaven we'll find out what a difference even our most meager prayers made. So don't, don't be too discouraged. At times, I'm a little concerned when I need to see the numbers and I was concerned because, you know, and I don't know about some of you in Florida and other places where you've been open for a while, but uh, we had a capacity of 100 and uh, only 50 came to the masses. So we didn't, we don't have a waiting list. People aren't breaking the door down to get in. And um, there's several reasons for that. I know some are older and there's not ready or they feel unsafe, but there, I, I know that a lot of them too are the lukewarm ones who the church was barely relevant at all. And they might come to hear some good music or a sermon, but they kind of drifted from it. And it's going to take a lot longer to get them back. We've got a lot of work to do, everybody, you know. But do it. And endure the suffering and the guff. And realize that there's a reward waiting for you in heaven, okay? So, yeah, at times, you're like, oh, I don't feel like anything's accomplished. And the numbers keep dropping. And no matter what I do, and, okay. God didn't say the gospel would always be in season. He implied it would also be out of season. Preach it anyway. Preach it anyway. Okay. So going on now, verse 9 uh, and following. Um, 
Yeah. Now there's a lot of names in here, Liz. You wanna you wanna do these tongue twisters, or you want me to do it? You. <laughs> All right. Do you, now these are this is just the final personal end of the of the letter. Okay. Uh, do your best to come to me soon, uh, Timothy. Uh, for Damus, who is in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone on to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone on to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Now let's just stop there for a minute. This list contains people who have, uh, some of whom have been mentioned in other letters, like Damus is mentioned in two other letters. Um, it says your Damus enamored of the present world has left me. So he left for a very negative reason. Uh, he just, you know, the gospel and the disciplines of the Christian life, he, he'd rather go to the orgies, he'd rather go to the theater, he'd rather go to the gymnasium, you know, so he's left me. That Damus is enamored of this world, he's left me now. Uh, and yet he was one of Paul's uh, close companions, you know, so Paul's a little disappointed about that. Now, the other list here uh, doesn't mean they deserted him. Maybe they, they were sent on mission. So Crescens has gone off to, Del to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Uh, Luke alone is with me. Okay, so Luke is still with him. Now, notice this. This is a nice little line here, a little redemption line. Get, get Mark and bring him with you, uh, for he's very useful to, for my ministry. Now, that's the guy that abandoned them in the first missionary journey. And he says that would, he would never go on a journey with him again. And it was so severe because he was the nephew of Barnabas that Barnabas and Saul parted company over that. And now, all of a sudden, Paul's calling Mark useful. So apparently, Mark has redeemed himself <laughs> in, in Paul's eyes. Okay, so there's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a redemption there or a little bit of a, a reconciliation. Okay, nice, nice to see that. Uh, now it goes on to say, Tychicus, uh, I have sent on to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with the uh, with uh, the carp the, the carpus uh, the um, uh, at Troas, um, uh, and also the books, uh, the scrolls, probably more literally, and above all the parchments. Okay. Now, by the way, I don't want you to underestimate. Those are very valuable things. You don't just leave them behind unless you're you're bugging out in a big hurry. You know how Paul had to sometimes get the heck out of Dodge in the middle of the night sometimes because they were coming for him. So he left some valuable things behind. A cloak is very important and valuable in that climate because it gets very chilly at night. And so wherever he, whenever he left there, he had to get out in a big hurry, okay? Um, likewise, um, um, he also um, left some scrolls and those are very expensive. We're talking, you know, 20 grand a scroll in modern terms. So to have a scroll of scripture Whew, they, they must have been, he must have had a very good benefactor, somebody who got those things for him. And I'm sure they were, they were kept very carefully under lock and key somewhere, but Paul wants them to be brought to him, okay? Now, he goes on to say here, um, um, Alexander the coppersmith did be a great deal of harm, uh, but the Lord will repay him. Now, Alexander the coppersmith is mentioned... Um, no, I don't have I don't have my other notes. He's mentioned in the first letter, but in effect, he, he's mentioned in the first letter of Timothy. In effect, it, it, Alexander the coppersmith um, is is a um, um, basically a Judaizer. Um, he was apparently a very effective uh, synagogue leader and a preacher, and had had come on to the Christian band. But he then began preaching that you had to be circumcised and take up the whole Jewish law, which was in complete contradiction to the Council of Jerusalem that had said otherwise. And he was, he, was, uh, he was able to mislead a lot of people and lead them out of the Christian faith and back into Judaism. And um, he, he says that you know, he, he did me a great deal of harm. Now, he said he did me a great deal of harm, but I think what Paul really means here is that he's misled many people. He's harmed my ministry, which is to bring people to Christ and righteousness through Christ rather than through the law. And so I think rather than just being this is a personal wound, uh, I think Paul's speaking more of the harm he's done to the preaching of the gospel. Um, may, and it says here, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Now, this doesn't sound, this could be sounding like he's cursing him. But again, just simply look, may the Lord requite, the Lord will take care of this at this point. Many times you've heard me say this, that if you've been really hurt by somebody or somebody's really hurt someone or something that you care about, we can become very indignant and, and we can be very, we can carry this like a heavy bowling balls of anger and resentment. And sometimes all we can do is what Paul has done here. I, look, I've given them to God. Um, 
God saw everything, and if he doesn't repent, he'll answer to God one day for what he's done. And it's in God's hands now. See, And uh, this is something that we've got to maybe get better at, because all of us in life have been very deeply hurt by people. And when you care about people, you can be hurt. And um, sometimes people disappoint and let us down and hurt us. So at the end of the day, the more we can just say, this is now in God's hands and just give it over for God is, 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 a, is a great gift to ask for, okay? All right, and then he says, um, beware now, uh, beware of him yourself, all right? For he strongly opposed our message, okay? Now, in my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. Now, remember, he's in Rome and in jail, okay? It's, it's possible some people think he was in jail still back at Caesarea, before he's gone to Rome, but in either case, he says here, um, and this could be a Jewish way of speaking. Remember, you've heard me talk like this before. At my, at my first defense, nobody came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. <laughs> but the Lord stood by me. You know, he encouraged me. You know. So are we using hyperbole here, or is this meant univocally? Literally, nobody came to your at your defense. I mean, that's hard to believe, Paul. Well, even if you're in Caesarea or back in Jerusalem, uh, whether you're talking about that or you're talking about Rome, I mean, surely some people came, you know. So is this just sort of Jewish hyperbole or what have you? But his main point is, look, the Lord is beside me and uh, he strengthened me so that through the message I might be, be uh, so that the met through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory and, and honor forever and ever. Amen. So again, this idea that the Lord will rescue me. Now, that doesn't mean you'll never die. That doesn't mean you'll never suffer. It just simply means that um, if the worst, what's the worst thing this world can do to you? It'll kill you, right? If you die, though, faithful to God, maximum promotion, right? I mean, you get to leave this lunatic asylum and go home where things actually make sense. So you see what I'm saying, you know, we have to mis we can't misunderstand that this is some sort of vapid, nothing will, no harm will ever befall me, but, but no, no harm that will permanently destroy me will ever, you know, will come to me if I trust God. So yeah, they might kill me. Um, there's comes, you know, but, but the, at the end of the day, that's still promotion um, because I get to go home and be with God. St. Paul says to, to, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. See? So again, we have to, I think, recover. And I, I think we all have different opinions and ideas about this whole COVID thing we're going through. But you've heard me before. I think that we've got to really begin to recover ourselves. We've lost our nerve. And it's time to put on our big boy pants and go out into a dangerous, big, bad world that has all kinds of, not just COVID, but all kinds of bacteria and all kinds of viruses and other threats. And, uh, and we have to begin to venture back out. You know, fear not, little flock. It has pleased the Father to give you an immune system. And by gosh, that thing works pretty well most of the time, you know. And um, so I, I, what I'm saying wouldn't have been controversial a year ago. This is the way Christians always talked. And now this whole thing's been politicized. But I'm still trying to talk like a Christian and saying, look, if there are good, strong, prudential reasons for you to limit your exposure, do it. But I think a lot of us have to also put on, we have to, we have to kind of recover our nerve and get back out and start, start doing, doing things again. And yes, it probably means the numbers will go up a little for a while. Yes, it does. It does. Most people who get the virus won't, won't suffer much. They'll get mildly sick. Some will get very sick, but only less than 1% will die. And I think we have to have a little more courage than I see right now. And I'm, I'm only saying that again, like I say, what I'm saying wouldn't have been controversial uh, six months ago. And now it has. But I will not be silenced as a Christian. My, my message remains the same. Do not be afraid. Stop being so afraid. Would that people were as, a, as afraid of their, what's happening to their souls as they are right now about this possible thing happening to their bodies. We're, we're, we're just way, you know, we're all focused on this. When with the bigger problems, we're not focusing on. So I think that's uh, something I want to say. And I, I also want to encourage prudence. We have Dr. Ben here and he'll say, no, yes, but be, wear a mask. And, uh, you know, take necessary precautions. And if necessary, stay home because you're, yes. But I mean, I'm, I'm talking now for the, for the m many of us who, it's, 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 it's time to recover our courage. Okay. And it's, it's a big, bad world out there. I, I make no guarantees. I make no guarantees.
but the worst thing this world can do is kill you. And if you're faithful, going up yonder. Okay. By the way, I have an article coming out tonight on the blog along those lines. Um, the right kind of fear, the wrong kind of fear. Okay. Okay, final greeting. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Aniferous. Uh, Erastus remained in Corinth. Uh, I left Tro Tro Trophimus, who was ill uh, at Miletus. Um, do your best to come before winter. The Willis sends greetings to you, as do Prudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit and grace be with you. And let the church say, Amen. Now, the fundamental part of this message today for us was do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Do, I'll say it again, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Be re yeah, we have to endure hardships, but there's a reward waiting. See, it's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. And I use it very often at, uh, you know, priest retreats. Oh, oh, right. Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, Okay, so we have a, a decision to make, and uh, Ben, I wanted to talk to you about this before, but you know, we, well, anyway, we were like ships passing in the night. Ben, ben uh, what I could do if we, if we want to is, you know, there's uh, three chapters of Titus, um, and the third chapter is very short, so I could do another two weeks and cover Titus, or we can have you do a little bit of work. Um, so I guess the question is um, whether you'd feel like you know, you're ready to maybe uh, talk to us a little bit the next two weeks um, or you want me just to do Titus and you'll do the uh, after those two weeks uh, let, let's let's pull the trigger and let's let's do it for the next two weeks okay so Ben as you know has experience as a medical doctor but also you know there's a lot of um, parallels between physical health and spiritual health and but he's got some just some of the experiences that he, he had being a doctor and I thought it would be good to uh, to kind of spiritualize this, and maybe he and I will work together, but put some scriptures together too. But whatever, we can work on that, Ben. But uh, we'll go ahead and have you do that, and um, I'll pick up with Titus when when your seminar is finished. But I hope that you all will spread the word that we're going to hear from the good doctor. Amen. 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 Um, Amen. And he uh, he'll give us the real information. Okay. And uh, Amen. All right. So uh, good. Now, uh, will you be uh, here also? You're going to be here. You, well, you're going to be a student. I, I will. I will. Unless Ben says, don't be here because you'll make me nervous. And if he says <laughs> that, I won't be here. Don't be scared, Ben. Don't be I, scared. I don't think <laughs> be scared. Ben is usually made nervous. I don't think so. No, don't be scared. Yeah, I've, I, I've had him sit in on my classes. and He's much less intimidating as my husband used to be when he sat on my classes. <laughs> Right. Oh man, I couldn't say a word when Kevin sat into my classes. Mm -hmm. he, he messed me up completely. That's uh -oh. <laughs> we know why, Liz, but we're not gonna go into that tonight. I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Monsignor, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I have. A, I just have a question, Monsignor. Are you gonna continue to send me the link so that I can send it to you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Do okay. I got a question about the scripture. Um, when when he was saying in um, he said, I fought the good fight, I have run the race. Uh, was he in jail at that time? Was he about to die? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Depending on when you date the letter, he's either in jail at Caesarea, uh, or he's in jail in Rome. Okay, so 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 that's what he meant because it was kind of. Confusing at the time. Um, at one point, I was thinking that maybe, you know, like, well, he's done all, you know, all of all of his living. So now, you know, like God is, I've done, I, you know, no more sin in my life, you know, I've, all of that kind of thing. But what he's he, he he still has more life. He just is like ready to about to be set, um, killed at that. That's what he meant about yeah. I fought the good fight. I've run the race. Yeah. And now I'm ready to go home to God. Yeah, he says, I'm, already being about poured to out. Die. I'm already being poured out like a libation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's about to die. Yeah. And in that sense, he's about to die. Yeah. He, he at least he, he presumes that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, now I know what he's 
why he's thinking that way. Okay, that right. makes more sense to me. Okay. All right. Because, yeah. Any last minute questions? Anyone else? No, I'm good. Well, all right. So we'll look forward to next week and um, new topic. And we'll also um, ask the blessing now for all of you. All right. May, the peace, may God, uh, may God uh, bless all of you and may every grace be yours in abundance. Um, may we all, Lord, uh, by your grace, fulfill our ministry and do the work of an evangelist. Uh, we may we be able to endure the suffering that comes, but also look forward to the reward that waits. And, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And may Almighty God bless you all now, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 I enjoyed it. Bye, 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 Bye. All right, now. <laughs> My